Good morning. Welcome. Today we are going to be talking about taxes through the four stages of retirement. And I've had the chance to speak with many of you over the last few weeks, so we hope that you're able to really get a lot out of this. Again, this is taxes in retirement. And, um, you know, like I said, we've had a chance to speak together with many of you. And I just want to take a minute to acknowledge you for signing up, for um, for taking some time to understand how taxes um, are going to affect you through the different stages of retirement. I know some of you haven't retired yet. Other, others of you are very much in the, the retirement phase. But this course is really designed for people like you who are looking to learn more and really maximize things in retirement. So I just want to take a minute to acknowledge you for that. We hope that you get a lot out of our course today, really get some good takeaways. And I encourage you to write down questions along the way, and we'll do our best to address those. On the right-hand panel, there's actually a, an area where you can enter those questions. And we'll, if we don't get to them, we'll make sure we follow up. Additionally, throughout the webinar, you'll have a chance to sign up for a part two with us. And that's really designed by feedback from people where they really wanted a chance to understand and individualize things a little bit more for their situation. So we encourage you to sign up for that if you think that it would be a good fit for you. Um, and really, it, again, it's just I'm, our goal is to help you take away some nuggets and potentially trigger some good dialogue so you can really feel prepared as you move into retirement. Um, I'm presenting today with my dad, Bob. He's been in the industry for over 30 years, guiding clients through many situations um, and you know, across three generations. I'm a certified financial planner, accredited investment fiduciary, and graduated with honors from Brown, where I studied economics and then actually worked in D.C. for uh, consulting for wealth management firms. I also have a master's in public health and a huge passion for the health and wealth connection. So we'll tie a few of those things together as we go along. But with that, I think um, I'll let Bob share an example to get us started. I'd like to say good morning as well. I hope you all, all are safe and doing well during these kind of stressful times. I, I think this slide, what we want to start with is just there's a big difference between, um, you know, a before tax net worth and an after tax net worth. And it really depends uh, for a lot of people who have their qualified plans and non-qualified plans. It depends upon the withdrawal strategies that they use that'll determine um, uh, how much income they'll have at the end or how much their net worth is. Uh, this is just a really quick example, but it's a way to kind of tee it up. It's very simple. We'll be going into more detail on some of these things later on. But uh, what it shows, if you have a $500,000 in your qualified plan, what number is that actually for your spendable income? And as you know, it depends upon your tax brackets that you take it out in. So, for example, if you take it out in, you know, a 35 percent tax bracket, that five hundred thousand dollars is really only three twenty five. Um, thirty seven percent tax bracket, three hundred fifteen. But the, the importance here, I think, is as you look at your long term planning is to develop develop strategies to take those dollars out um, in the lowest tax brackets possible. And there's ways to do that by doing different withdrawal strategies. And what I mean by that is the years you take it out in, try to take out the qualified plans in the lower tax years where you have that, if you have that control. And many times you do uh, through a combination of uh, different strategies. Um, and as you know, conventional wisdom sometimes on IRAs, so that's what this slide's addressing, is just let it grow tax deferred until retirement or until RMD, which is age 72. That's your required minimum distribution. That's when you have to start taking money out of a retirement plan. Um, sometimes that may be a good strategy and many times it's not because what that does, it forces you to take quite a bit out at age 72, for example. If you have a large IRA and you, you, if you wait till that time to take it out, it may force you into some very high tax brackets. So um, once again, the, 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 the moral of the story is to look at the years and try to take those dollars out in years where you have lower taxes and that can have a, a, a big, big effect on how much um, really your spendable net worth is. That's great. And I and we're going to be jumping more into that as we keep going along, but just to tee it up and talk about some of the things that we're going to be addressing together. As you probably can imagine, we typically run these in person and now with everything going on, we're obviously doing them online. So we don't have the same way to interact with you, but we're hopeful that you'll be able to ask those questions 
um, and that we can follow up afterwards to help you address anything that might be outlying and potentially set up that additional meeting with you if there's further questions. Another just housekeeping item, again, in addition to those questions on the right-hand side, there's also three handouts that talk about the stages of retirement, the SECURE Act, and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And we're going to be referring to those later on. So just so you know that those are there, I think that's great. Um, and again, periodically throughout, you'll have a chance to set up that. You're going to see a pop-up and have a chance to set up that second meeting. Just X that out on the upper right-hand side if, you, um, if you're done and you want to close that out. The presentation this morning is going to be broken up into three main parts. First, we're going to talk about the big retirement risks. I think this is always a huge question for people. Next, we're going to talk about tax-efficient distributions. I know a lot of you had questions about how should I take things out? How can I maximize and optimize things? We're going to address that. We're going to talk about some hidden penalties. And then finally, we're going to bring it all together. We're going to talk more about the SECURE Act and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And we're going to talk about, we're going to give an example where you can really see some of this brought to light, which I think is, is really effective. So with that, um, just, a, you know, a caveat, we are, we always recommend that you seek your own professional tax advice. We give strategies, but we are wealth advisors and financial professionals. So just make sure that if you do have specific questions that you're seeking out a tax professional, as you can imagine, this is a really vast topic. Um, and then just as we you know, set, set things up today, we have so much changing right now, and we are all literally living through that in the moment between the CARES Act this year, everything going on politically, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the SECURE Act, there is a lot going on. And on top of that, you are likely getting ready and moving into a very different stage in your life. During the accumulation stage, when you're working, you have a lot of flexibility from a tax perspective. You can save more in a 401k. You have child tax credits. Um, but now potentially your mortgage is paid off, so you no longer have that deduction. And you have to think about Social Security and required minimum distributions and how to optimize all of this. So it's a really different game. And understanding it and acknowledging that it is something different, I think, we find is a really important part. And, the, you know, what you need to do at different times changes. So those early retirement years, we call them um, the work and save years. That's 50. It was 60. Now it's more like 70 where you're working, you're saving more money. You still have a really a good ability to set yourself up well. Then you move into the go-go years, the late 60s or 70s. You're traveling a lot. You're doing your hobbies. You're just really busy enjoying what life looks like after working. And then you move into middle retirement. You start to travel a little bit less. Things start to look a little different. And then finally, later retirement, where you're thinking more about legacy, more about estate planning. And we won't go too much into estate planning today, but we'll, we'll touch on a few pieces along the way. So let's get started with addressing, you know, the big retirement risks. So as we get started there, we'd love to understand, we're going to have a poll pop up asking you, what do you think your biggest retirement risk is? Is it inflation, longevity, health care, stock market risk, public policy risk? And I think that that kind of leads us into uh, what Bob's going to be talking about more, which is what are these big risks? Yeah. Yeah. This this slide here just is a good framework, we think, for uh, goal-based retirement planning. And it's a, a framework we use as we go through a process with our clients. Um and on the left-hand side, you can see the first thing to do at retirement time is just define what your goals are going to be. You know, that's your income needs, retirement income needs, um, contingency expenses we have. There are things like travel, second homes, um, things like that, and legacy goals. Is there 529 plans or other money you want to save for grandchildren's college education? Um, but, you know, a number of legacy goals we could talk about. But those things are much more easier to define. You know, we can plan on those. We can put into, okay, here's going to be our retirement income need based upon our planning, our budgets. Uh, this is the kind of travel we like to do. So that's a number we can put in. Um, but that you need to coordinate that with different risks that are much more unknown. Uh, these are things that uh, we can't control these risks, but at least we can be aware of them and do some planning around it. And, you know, longevity risk, we'll talk more about that, inflation risk, health care, long-term care stock market risk. These are all things that can come up that can affect our retirement plan. Um, we don't know how they're going to affect them, um, 
but uh, we need to have some kind of awareness and a plan that addresses these things uh, as we go along. And then when you when you marry the you know the defining your retirement goals and then as ways to address some of these retirement risks, we think that's really what makes a strong retirement plan. Um, you put those things together and you've got a really good base for what you're going to be doing. So we think that this is a really helpful framework as we go through a process. Um, you know, we're going to talk about just a couple of those risks, you know, public policy risk. That's something that, you know, I think we can all look at this last year. It's, it's a, we don't know what, how it's going to happen or what's going to happen, but we just need to, uh, things come up over time that you can't plan for, but you want to be in a position where you don't do any knee jerk reactions to them. Um, uh, so, you know, what, what certainly the corona, the virus this year was one. We saw that, you know, we read some studies that in March of this year, a lot of people, uh, made some knee jerk reactions, taking money out of the, you know, investments accounts uh, and moving into money market account because that was there. Um, some of it never got back in and never took advantage of the, the market coming back up. So you just want to be aware of those things and have dollars positioned so you can uh, move through those phases as well. And I think a big piece that can happen when surprises come up quickly is you can get surprised and make those knee jerk reactions. But when you're able to really think through it ahead of time and have a plan around it, it just makes it a lot easier to move through. Yeah, good point here. And longevity risk, you know, this slide is is pretty simple. It just shows that uh, it's a little small to see. But um, if you're if you're a couple age 65, there's a 50 percent chance that one of you will be alive at age 95. Um, so you need to have a plan that addresses uh, income over a long period of time. That may be deferring Social Security till age 70. There's a lot of different things you can do to, to, uh, to uh, plan for that, but you need to have a plan for that longevity risk. Um. Another one is inflation. You know, we've had, we're experiencing about 2.2% inflation right now. Historically, it's been a little bit higher than that. Uh, certainly 3% is a good number to plan on going ahead, I think. Um, but, you know, if we have 3% inflation, that means that your purchasing power will be cut in half in 25 years. Um, and so that's that's important to have strategies to, you know, to address that. Uh, the other one we put up here is just cognitive abilities. You know, you probably have maybe had a situation in your own family where with, either with your parents or grandparents where decision-making abilities kind of, you know, dissipate or they become harder as you get older. So, you know, to have a plan to help address that, I think is really important too. I just want to um, ask really quickly, we got, we've gotten a little bit of feedback, just that there's a little bit of a hard sound with Bob. So if that is happening for you, just let us know so that we can adjust things a little bit. We've only heard from one or two people. So I just want to double check on that. And another just housekeeping item we sometimes have an issue with is if your screen is too small, make sure that you're hitting that upper right little box to maximize it and really making it as big as you can. That um, that should take care of that specific issue. Um, I'll, I'll try to, um, well, well, hopefully it won't be quite as hard, I guess, is the thing. But um, another risk that we always see is sequence return risk. And we're, we're going to go through this real quickly because I think it's probably one of the major risks at retirement time. And what this slide shows is it's a slide you've probably seen many times, but it shows that the rates of return from different asset classes. Um, the green is the stock market being defined by the S&P 500. Uh, the blue is, is a bond uh, index and the gray is a combination of the two. But you can see that time does reduce risk. And that's the important thing at retirement time. It's kind of basic blocking and tackling, I think, but you just have to realize that um, stock market risk over any one year one year period of time can be very volatile, but the longer the holding period, um, the more that that comes together. So actually over 25 years, there's less risk on the downside with the stock market than there is with bonds, but you need to have that time frame. So the moral of the story is you, you know, put together at retirement time, you need to have an, um, an awareness that uh, time does reduce risk. And I think no matter how much you look at these slides, when you're in the middle of making big decisions, it always helps to go back and look at history and what it shows us and, and remember why you're setting things up the way you are. I think it can really help put everything into, into context. So this is just a quick example on, uh, 
unsequenced return risk. And it, it shows a uh, two portfolios. Portfolio A is the red line. Portfolio B is the blue line. Uh, the same amount of money is invested, and the returns are exactly the same, except in reverse order. So portfolio A starts with starts out with good returns, and at the end it has the negative returns. And portfolio B starts out with the negative returns and ends up with the positive returns at the end. So exactly the same returns, except we flip the order. And over a 25-year you know, period of time, you have the same amount of money. Uh, so there, there's no difference in your uh, account value at the end, as long as you don't take any money out. Uh, the risk is, uh, um, maybe the next slide, Carrie, is when you start doing withdrawals from these accounts, um, we have, we're have we doing a 5% withdrawal from this account now. And uh, you can see that if you start out with, with good returns, your, your net worth is just fine. You start out with positive returns and um, Things work out well, but if you if you have a situation where you start out with negative returns and a five percent withdrawal, you can see you run out of money in 13 years. That's just investing the money in the S and P 500 with a five percent withdrawal rate. And certainly, if it's kind of not ancient history now, but in 2007, 2008, you you heard of people going back to work because you know the sequence of return risk was real for them. They were doing withdrawals, and we had quite a drop in the market. So we need to have a plan to address that sequence of return risk. And there's a lot of different risks that you face in retirement. These are just a few examples of them, but there's ways that you can also, you know, do your do as much as you can to think about, plan for, control some of these risks. And so one piece of that is looking at just your income strategy. So there's kind of three primary ways um, that you can approach just the retirement income part of it. And again, we'll we'll talk about some of those other risks later on. But one is um, one way to think about, okay, how much am I going to need to retire you know, in retirement? How should I approach that is the probability-based approach. So this is probably the most well-known people way that people set up their retirement. And it's looking at saying, okay, I have a whole portfolio and I'm going to take out, for example, for a 4% annual distribution from that total portfolio. And that strategy can work great for people if they have a really high net worth, if they aren't worried about running out of money, um, or really just want you know, to maximize things. What it doesn't control for as much is it doesn't protect against, for example, that sequence of return risk, which we just mentioned, pulling money out at the wrong time. It is more susceptible to, you know, declining cognitive abilities and not setting it up the right way. There's just there's more risks involved with that type of strategy when you're using it alone. Another strategy that's that's pretty well known is just it's called time segmentation. And you can see on this slide, we have three circles to represent three different buckets. So essentially, this is saying, let's set up, you know, different periods of time when I'm going to need different portions of my retirement savings. So short term would be invested more conservatively, medium term, maybe the next seven to 15 years would be invested in a moderate to moderate growth bucket. And then finally, long term money. So this is legacy. This is money you're not going to need for 20 years. And this would be invested more for growth, knowing that going back to that, that um, returns chart we looked at, that you have the ability to withstand ups and downs. Um, and so that can be invest invested in a different way. So that approach can work great um, for certain things, but again, not perfect for every situation. And then finally, we have the last approach, which is the safety first approach. This essentially just says I'm going to take all of my money and I'm going to convert it into a way that I can meet all of my retirement income needs with some sort of bonds or annuities or some type of retirement income strategy. And again, depending on what you're looking for and what's important, there's different reasons to set them up in different ways for yourself. I think one thing that the research does show is that if you have some amount that you know is coming in every month that isn't subject to volatility in the markets, the people are happier. They have a little bit more ease in retirement. But that's not to say that that's how it should all look. But those are just three basic ways that you can think about um, and most people will plan for what that retirement income stream looks like. Anything to add there, Bob? No, I, I think that's um, – no, I, I, I don't. Um, so then it just kind of takes us to, well, what makes most sense for you? What does the research actually say? I'm, I'm 
kind of a geek. I love to look at numbers. So, you know, the probability based approach, um, you know, is more comfortable accepting greater volatility for a higher return. Whereas the safety first approach that, you know, guaranteed amount coming in looks for alternatives that do not necessarily have the, the same exposure to the markets. So to help us put this into context, we can look at some work by, um, you know, a well-known researcher in this field, Wade Fow, who's a um, professor at Princeton and the American College. And what you'll see on the right-hand side um, is that there's different spending sources for two retirement income tools. So here we have a bond ladder and we have an annuity. So a bond ladder is essentially a series of bonds that are staggered whereas annuity is some sort of um, income that incorporates risk pooling. And I think what's interesting here is that with the same assumption for interest rates, the income annuity provides three sources of spending plus risk pooling. And the risk pooling allows for 35% more inflation adjusted spending over um, this example's lifetime. So again, this isn't to say you know, that's perfect, but it's just understanding, well, how can we approach and think about this? But then the question becomes whether the premium from the stock market will provide, you know, sufficiently higher risk um, for a diversified investment portfolio. So what the left graph is essentially showing us, and apologies if it's a little small, is just that um, we're using, you know, very similar assumptions, but it's saying that 100% bond portfolio can successfully match an annuity um, for spending over a 20-year time frame, but by age 90, it's going to run out of money. Whereas a stock portfolio can actually match that up to age 100, but it only has a probability of 66% of success. So that means that in 34% of cases, the stock portfolio will deplete before retirement. So that's a little bit scary if you're in the situation where you're saying, okay, what is my I want to make sure that I'm going to have enough to last potentially until age 95. So what are the ways that I can incorporate all three of these to be the most effective in my situation? And I think for everybody, it's it's individual and it's specific, but there's some, some ways that we tend to approach and think about this. And that leads us to what we just call our um, guidance retirement process, where we essentially look at the specific situation, but then say, hey, and this is what you can do on your own, too, to some extent, right, is what is your income for? What's coming in from Social Security? Maybe you have some pensions. Maybe you have already have an annuity or you have a bond ladder. Well, what is that? How much is that on a monthly basis that you can count on no matter what happens? And then how much more do you need to meet what your goals are, to meet your expenses? And then say, okay, let's put some of that into the next five-year bucket where bucket one, you use the additional amount to supplement what you need on an annual basis up and beyond that income floor. And then in bucket two, that's money you probably won't need till years five to 10 plus. Invest it a little bit more, you're gonna get a little bit more in returns. Bucket three, more midterm strategies, a little more growth. And then finally up into the right, this is that bucket where you would say, this is, this is going to my kids, this is legacy, or I'm not gonna need this for 20 years. So that's where you can get more, you know, a higher return, but also accept a little more volatility. So by setting it up this way, and, and even just for you to think about it this way, it helps you understand what is that income floor and how can I set up strategies on the income side to control for some of the big risks that can come up. Yeah, and I think I think as you look at that, um, what that provides, this kind of system provides a lot of ease at retirement time. For example, uh, when you're matching your income floor and your expenses, you know what you're going to need the next five years. When you uh, And you have that invest in a very conservative strategy. Um, so if the market corrects, you realize that, geez, I'm covered for the next five years. I don't have to, uh, I'm, I'm okay. Um, it's, it's, it's not going to go down. It's a very low risk investment. Whereas the, the money that you have in that 20 year bucket or 15 to 20 year bucket the market corrects and you're saying, that's okay. You know, I, I have a long time frame. It matches up with the, um, you know, the, the returns over time real well. So it just brings a lot of certainty and more ease uh, at, at return time. And that's something we see, you know, taking place all the time. Certainly this last year was a really good example of how, how this can help you live better, right? And not have as much stress when you are in retirement. 
So that brings us to, um, I mean, that's that was the first section, really going over what are big risks from an income side? How can you think about it? And next, we're going to move into how you couple that with tax efficient distributions and some of the hidden penalties that can come up during retirement. So again, if you're taking notes and you have questions, um, we certainly invite you to, to schedule that part two with us where you can go in more detail. But with that, I think we'll we'll jump into this next section. So, Bob, you want to take this take this one? I can, I can talk that. Um, the uh, we're gonna have some slides coming up that really talk about you know the most tax efficient way to take money out, and certainly there's a big difference between what your you know when to use your taxable accounts or your tax deferred accounts. But the idea is to coordinate among these different accounts that you have so you bring them out most tax efficiently. And, you know, many times we've, we've all heard the term asset allocation. Well, the term tax allocation really is just as re important at retirement time. And really what this centers on is, you know, you have two kinds of accounts. You have your taxable accounts and you have your IRAs or your tax-free or Roth IRAs, but your tax-free or tax-deferred accounts. And they have different tax brackets. Um, so we want to make sure we put the right assets in the right you know, right accounts. So the more tax efficient, as you put together your asset allocation, you want to make sure that your investments that are more tax sensitive or have a higher tax to them, they go into your IRAs. Uh, that'd be taxable bonds, you know, REITs, high yield bonds, things like that. They may be a very important part of your overall asset allocation, but they're also taxed at a higher rate. They're taxed at ordinary income rates. So as you look at your overall asset allocation, let's move those into the tax free or tax deferred accounts. Whereas the taxable accounts, um, where we can be very tax efficient, you know, because it's capital gains rates, we can harvest losses, we can match gains and losses, we can be very tax efficient with stocks. Certainly municipal bonds are, are tax free, you know, if they're if state bonds. Um, and as I said, you can, the tax managed funds that we have, the overlay managers, it's just having very tax efficient gain and loss strategies so that you're matching up gains and losses. So that becomes a very tax efficient return. So you may say that, you know, I want 60% of my money in a tax in, in equities and 40% in bonds, but let's do it in a way where that 40% that's in the higher yielding bonds, that's in your IRA. Um, so it makes a big difference in your overall returns. Um, yeah, we can't emphasize this enough, really make, looking through what you have and seeing, you know, how, it, how it's broken down for you. Uh, and this is just, a, you know, another quick example, but it, it's an example where there's a Sam and Jill and they both have the same amount in their IRAs and the same amount in their Roth IRAs. And they need $15,000 per month. So the question is, where do they take it from? Well, that'll depend on a number of things, really. Um, but the idea is to take it out as tax efficiently as you can. So if you have a pension plan or you know, different kind, of, whatever your floor is, that, that's going to determine a large part when you take it out. But um, what you want to really look at is to try to find a way to take the IRA dollars out uh, in lower tax brackets, because that's ordinary income. Whenever you take money out of an IRA, as you know, I'm sure you know, that's ordinary income. Um, that joint taxable account may be very tax efficient. So, um, you know, in a year that you need more income um, and you're already in a high tax bracket, you may want to tap into that taxable account because maybe you had, don't have as many gains or things like that. But it really is an individual decision each year. You can do a long term plan around it, but you just want to make sure that you maximize your after tax withdrawal strategies. Um, I think on this one, it's just, you know, right now, this year, more than ever, almost all clients at retirement time, we went through and we've looked at this, does a Roth IRA conversion make sense? And we've done it for a couple of reasons. One is there was no RMDs required this year, the required minimum distributions, which for many clients, that puts them in a high tax bracket to begin with. But what a Roth IRA is, as you may or may not know, it's when you take your IRA and you switch it to a Roth IRA. The advantage of it long-term is the money that comes out of the Roth is tax-free. Um, so, you know, going down the road, you'll have tax-free income that you can take out. Um, the, the, the hurdle on, on converting to a Roth is that you need to pay the tax when you convert it in that year. So, um, for example, if, you, you know, if you're gonna convert $100,000 in a Roth IRA to a, from an IRA to a Roth, 
in the year that you do that, you need to pay the tax on that money. But now that can be, you know, um, coordinated with if, if you have you have no RMDs this year, you just try to take it out. This year has been a great year to do that because we, we've been able to keep some clients in some pretty low tax brackets through a combination of things that we'll even talk more about later. But whether it be donor advised funds or things like that, but you're trying to match up. Um, ways to, to lower your tax in the area that you do convert the Roth um, because there's so many advantages to a Roth going down the road. And we're going to talk about a lot of those advantages for those of you. And I know there's some of you that have not retired yet. This is really a really important time to understand and look at how you're currently contributing to retirement accounts. So most places now have the option to contribute not on, only to a traditional 401k, but also to a Roth 401k. And so really making sure that you're looking at your tax bracket in the given year, your tax bracket in retirement or what you think it might be, and then saying, okay, does it make a little bit more sense to contribute to some more of the Roth portion? At first, it can be a little bit of a shock and like an upfront, why would I want to do that? I think all of us want to delay something that doesn't necessarily put us in a better situation that year. But we're going to talk about this later. As we go through long-term projection, it can make a massive difference not only for your life, but if you have kids, really leaving a stronger legacy for them. And again, we're going to talk about this, but just laying the seeds that Roth conversions and having a Roth bucket is more important than ever, especially as we think about what tax rates are going to look like moving forward. Yeah, that's. I think that's the other reason we looked at Roth so strongly this year. We just realized that, um, and we don't know if this will happen, but there's been an awful lot of debt taken on this year, um, you know, to get through the um, you know, the coronavirus and things. And that probably pushes us into higher tax brackets down the road because, you know, that'll need to be paid for. So if there's ways to can do some things this year in perhaps lower tax brackets, um, it makes it beneficial down the road um, as we may be in higher tax brackets and taking money out tax-free at that time. Yeah, which which again can just really put you in a, a strong situation. So we talked about kind of what to think about. And we're, again, going to give an example later on how to think about taking money out. But the big takeaway there is levelizing it. So you look at your current tax bracket, you look at what it's going to be in the future, so that you are kind of maximizing where things are now through the different retirement accounts you have. In addition to that, um, other ways that you can save on taxes, we're going to talk about that next. So what are some of the hidden things that sometimes get forgotten? We're going to start with Social Security. So here, just a prelude, because I know there were some questions um, from people around this. So I just want to touch on it for one minute. But Social Security, you know, if you're born after 1960, your age is going to be 67. And whenever you take that early, you're giving about up about 6% of growth. You know, for example, if you take it at age 62. Now, there's certain situations where that might make sense for you. If you're in a place where you can wait to take that until age 70, you get 8% growth on that every year until age 70. So that's not insignificant. So thinking about what do what do you need for Social Security and when does it make sense to take it? This is another slide that's sort of helpful. And it's basically just telling us on the bottom there, if you were to claim at age 62, when is the break even for you, that point at which, um, you know, it might have been better to think about it differently and what the amount is that you can take. And as you can see, obviously, the longer you wait, the more you're going to be able to take out. But that break even age goes, for example, from age 62, where it's age 78 to age 70, where it gets closer to the 80s. And we see this when we run individual examples for clients of just kind of what that looks like. So it's there's not a one size fits all here. But oftentimes, if you're able to wait, that does tend to make a lot of sense just because you have that guaranteed growth happening. So that's just sort of a, a Social Security 101, some things to think about. In addition to that, you know, Social Security is taxed differently. So that's what we're going to talk about now. This is just an example of Bill. He's retired. He has taxable income of about 42000 He's in the 22% tax bracket. And this is about 38000 of IRA income plus 25000 in Social Security benefits. And so what he's looking to do is tap his IRA for another $1,000 for a concert road trip. So the question is, how much does he owe on this $1,000? And again, this example may not be as relevant for some of you, um, but it just points to some of the different things that can come up. 
And what we find is that just by taking out that additional thousand dollars, he now has to pay more on his he, more of his social security becomes taxed. So it's not his marginal tax rate effectively becomes like 40.7% instead of the stated marginal rate at 22% just because that additional thousand dollars makes more of his social security taxable. So that's just something to keep in mind as you look at those brackets and think about what makes sense for you in a given situation is really looking to say, hey, you know, is are, are any of these things going to have um, going to change things for me? And for example, when we work with our clients, we actually run an analysis so that you have some of this information that's available. Additional challenges that come up, you know, if you are married is the death of the first spouse. Obviously, up until that time, you've had you know, the standard deduction, married standard deduction from your filing, that a lot of that's lost, and you're in a higher tax bracket for single filers, and there can be changes to social security. So it's good to just understand kind of the impacts that different changes and surprises can happen um, at various points. Yeah, I think on that, Carrie, it's just important to have that as part of your planning. If, if there is a death, how does that affect the income of the surviving spouse at that time? Because you know, half the Social Security could be gone. There's just a number of things that need to be looked at. Um, and that's just, again, part of the overall planning. So another important thing to understand is just the impact of additional income on Medicare or different taxes that you might experience. A lot of you probably know that there is something called IRMA, which is your income-related monthly um, adjustment amount for Medicare um, and also Part D. And so it's just understanding in this example, you have George and Martha, they have Medicare Parts B and D, they have 271,000 in their modified adjusted gross income um, in this year. And they were looking to sell stock for a thousand dollar gain. So the thought is how, you know, does that have an impact? Um, if they're currently in the 18.8% tax bracket, what does that look like? And what we see is even that additional thousand dollars, kind of like our social security example, kicks them up to that next range. So they go from a monthly premium of 289 to 376, um, which isn't nothing. And part D increases as well. So if you look at the aggregate impact that that has on them, um, it's several thousand dollars more that they'll be paying in taxes just for that additional thousand dollars. Now, again, that's not to say that this is you know, going to make or break anything for people, but it is important to understand and to incorporate in planning is just understanding what, you know, at different points when different incomes change, it impacts different pieces, whether that's social security, whether or not that's, that's the IRMA charge. So just keeping in mind what that looks like and how to think about it can be really important. So if we then think about that, and how can you help control some of these tax brackets? We've talked a lot about the importance of doing it. So what are different ways that you can think about it? So, you know, first of all, before you retire or even early on when you have the chance, accumulating sources of tax-free income. So this is distributions from Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks. If you remember, those come out tax-free. You get taxed on them up front. So unlike with traditional accounts where you have to pay taxes, those are tax-free. Other things, withdrawals from health savings accounts, um, which is used for qualified medical expenses. So if you haven't retired yet, looking at this for yourself, it's up to like $7,000 that families can contribute every year, and you can invest that amount. So just if, if that does apply to you, you know, letting that grow and save over time. Withdrawals from cost basis or loans from cash value life policies. We're not going to talk about that too much. The portion um, of withdrawals from a non-qualified annuity that's a non-taxable return of premium is something else to think about. Borrowing from a reverse mortgage. Again, this is absolutely not for everyone, but it can make sense in very specific situations. And limiting taxable uh, required minimum distributions. As we'll talk about in just a minute, now RMDs have been pushed back from 70 and a half to age 72, um, but they're still probably going to have to happen. So you can make direct transfers to charities, um, and that can also be a way to lower your taxable income. And we're going to touch on that um, next. 
So that sort of leads us into this next part, which is just charitable giving and tax planning. What can you do? The example here is Albert and Shirley. They're in the 32% tax bracket and they're giving $14,000 every year to charity. They have 13,000 in existing itemized deductions, which as you know, have really been limited. We're gonna talk about that next. Um, and then their, their standard deduction, which is about 27,000. So what you see here is just the impact of this QCD for them and the, the benefit of it. So what you see on the left is they're taking out $14,000 from their IRAs. They wanna have $14,000 net. So that means after taxes. So the charity gets 14,000, 14,000 and satisfies their RMD and is reported as taxable income. But the tax bill on that distribution is 32%. So effectively, the cost of that charitable distribution, if you go IRA, checking account charity, is about $18,480. Whereas if you were to look at what we have on the right-hand side, which is doing a direct qualified char charitable distribution. So you kind of take out the middle step. You go directly from an IRA to a charity, and there's no, it's not a taxable event for you, so it lowers your taxable income. So this can be a really powerful thing to incorporate um, if you are someone who's charitably inclined and has large, large IRAs. And we'll talk about this in, in combination with a few other things here in the next slide. Anything to add to that, Bob? Well, I think the, the point is if you have a charitable intent, you know, with the new standard deduction um, being $27,000, if you were giving money before, let's say that $14,000 to keep the example the same, um, if you, you know, you're just taking 14,000 and giving to a charity, um, you're not getting any deduction for it anymore because the standard deduction is $27,000. So what we look for is ways to make that uh, some kind of tax benefit when you give that money to a charity. And one way of doing that, and we're talking about another way of doing it as well, but one way is through that qualified charitable distribution. So you're going to give money to a charity. You, you're you're taking some RMDs that you need to take out at retirement time. It just makes sense to to do this because um, uh, it goes to the charity and you're you know basically the it, directly. So it, it saves it saves a lot of money and you don't pay the tax on that fourteen thousand um, dollars. So there is some tax. We're bringing some tax benefit back to that charitable contribution. So a lot of clients we have do give money to charity. And this has been something that we've um, certainly been using uh, as a way to bring back a tax benefit for that the charitable gift that they're um, making. And that's, and that's more important than ever, right? Because we're going to talk about the SECURE Act and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and the impact of that. And that makes looking creatively at other strategies more important than ever. There's just, there's more to stay on top of and be aware of. So other things to think about in tax efficiently giving um, we talked about the char qualified charitable distributions. That's huge. Other things, you know, if you don't have huge RMDs or, you know, again, it depends on your situation. So donor advised funds can make a lot of sense. If you have, for example, low cost basis stock, you can actually gift that directly to a charity, reallocate it, and then use that as your pool. And what that does is it gets you above that new higher standard deduction and so you can get a benefit for that. So this is something that we're doing a lot for clients. It's essentially a bunching strategy, which you can look at differently. But that's really an important piece of looking at just making sure that every step of what you're doing is efficient. An and example of how the, just an example of how that works so well, and what we've done several this year, is let's say that you're giving $10,000 a year to a, to a charity. That's been your history, and that's what you want to continue doing. Um, once again, going back to that standard deduction, you may not be getting a write-off for that anymore. Um, so what if we do a donor advised fund where you put $100,000 into a donor advised fund? Um, that's, that gives you, you know, and then over the course of the next 10 years, you take $10,000 a year out of that donor advised fund and give it to a charity. So you've, you're, you're continuing with your gifting. But the advantage is the money that's over that twenty-seven thousand dollars again. That hundred, and you're giving a hundred thousand dollars. You're getting a tax. You're getting charitable right off for that. So it's once again bringing back um, um, some tax savings to to giving. Um, so it's a very effective strategy, and that in combination with the qualified charitable distribution can be very effective too. You know which one you do. 
Yep. And and we'll talk about this more in just a minute, but also potentially giving through your estate. There's reasons to do that. Obviously, there's a lot of, you know, even other complicated strategies we're not mentioning here. But the big idea is that if you do have a charitable intent, if that's one of your goals, understanding that it's really important to look at how you can maximize and get a benefit from that just because the tax laws have changed. So moving along, um, that kind of brings us to, to our last section, which is what did the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act do? How can we think about that, the SECURE Act? And then how can we bring some of these things together? Um, so we're going to have, we have a question come up here. Just do you feel like you have a good retirement income strategy? And I think I would add to that. Do you feel like you have ease and clarity, right? These are the two biggest things that you can create for yourself in retirement. And you're here, you're, you know, you care, you're listening to this stuff. So it's worth putting some time into really understanding that for yourself and, and how you think about it. So as we think about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you have a handout on the right hand side that actually gives a lot of really great details. So I encourage you to, if you want to pull that up now, or at least to know that it's available for you to look through as a reference, because it really is an important thing. Um, and you can take it out, you can print it off, you can have it as a reference, but Knowing that that's there, I think, is great. And there's a lot of things that happened with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And we're not going to talk about all of them in detail, but we're going to talk about a few of the biggest highlights from those. One of them is that many of the beloved deductions have been eliminated. And so this means that there is more to stay on top of than ever. So, you know, the charitable giving deductions, a lot of other deductions are no longer available. Um, so just knowing that that's there. Understanding that, and that the standard deduction has been increased, right? So that um, you know, twenty four thousand eight hundred and higher if you're in retirement. So that really changes what those strategies should look like. Another one is just where you live makes a difference, and how the new rules impact you, and what the specific state rules are where you live. So we're not going to touch on that too much because we have people from different places, but just knowing that that's there. Another one um, probably doesn't impact you as much, might impact kids or grandkids, but it's just the range of family tax issues that got changed as a result of this, whether that's school and how you use 29 plans, how alimony is paid, um, and, and just different things on estate planning have changed. And again, all of those details are there in that handout for you, so we're not going to spend time here now. And then um, just for business owners, right? If you are a business owner or were, you know that QVI um, is huge and there's just a lot of different ways and things to think about to make, make sure you're being efficient from um, that, that standpoint as well. So just knowing again, but the key piece probably as far as how we think about it is just the importance of understanding what de deductions have been eliminated for you. And if you haven't looked at this over the last few years, now's a really good time to jump in and make sure that you're understanding it. Anything else to add there, Bob, on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act? No, I don't think so, Carrie. Um, so then jumping to the SECURE Act. This is more recent, so if you aren't totally on top of it, um, you're not alone. This was December of 2019. And again, there's a specific handout going through a lot of details on this. Um, and a lot of it probably doesn't impact you now in retirement you'll see um, one of the big keys that got changed here was businesses have more incentives to create retirement plans for employees and promote participation than ever. This was really designed to help prepare people more effectively for retirement. Um, now you also, key number two, you have more time to save for retirement and more ways to save and more ways to use those funds. So you'll see um, if you look at the, the sheet there that you know, there's different ages now um, where you can contribute. And so that's just something to keep in mind. If you are a little bit older and still wanting to contribute to retirement plans, I really recommend you, you look at that piece. And then finally, probably the one that has the biggest impact in how we're looking at things for clients and planning is, is this, um, the changes to inheriting a traditional IRA or a traditional 401k. Your children can still inherit those if legacy is important to you, but now they have to take that money out within a 10-year period. So that means if your child is doing well and in a higher income bracket and they inherit a large IRA or 401k, 
they have to take that out within 10 years. Previously, they were able to extend that over their lifetime. And so that drastically decreased the amount that needed, needed to be taken out on an annual basis. So just understanding that that is big. So for example, we had a new client come in. Her dad hadn't been as on top of this. So if she inherited almost a million dollars in IRAs that she now has to take out over the next 10 years. Um, so just understanding there's more effective ways to do this. This is why the Roth planning we mentioned before is more important than ever. If you do have children and legacy is important and you have a large IRA or 401k is understanding, okay, does a Roth conversion make sense? Does potentially doing, um, you know, giving to charities directly make sense to lower that amount for you? And even potentially on the estate side, if you are charitably inclined and you have kids, we've done this for clients, setting up a little bit to be given directly to a charity um, as part of the estate can make sense. Relooking at life insurance can also make a lot of sense. There's this, this one really gets complicated and more nuanced, but if you do have a big IRA or 401k, I really, I highly recommend really understanding it. And that's something that we can help you talk through as well, um, because there's just more planning to do that ever specifically when you think about the impact of the Secure Act. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that, Carrie, is that uh, you mentioned the Roth. Um, and just in case you aren't aware, uh, when a child inherits a Roth IRA, they still have to take it out over 10 years, but it comes out tax free to them. And that's why uh, another reason, as you kind of put this puzzle together, if you will, of, of, of you know, wealth planning. Um, sometimes it makes sense to convert some to a Roth if you have a large one, especially because the money that goes to the kids will come out tax free, which uh, may be great for generational planning. Yeah, great. That's that's a really important point that we, should, we need to incorporate. Um, so we're going to just highlight again the four stages and then we're going to go into a specific example as we wrap up here. But you know, before retirement, what are the big things to think about? You know, it's knowing your after-tax savings before you retire, funding in the HSA. And again, it's more nuanced than this, but this is high level. Um, you know, really making good use of retirement plans, understanding Roth IRAs, Roth conversions, Roth 401k contributions, setting things up well so you have a lot of flexibility when retirement comes. If you are in retirement, it's really looking at how can you optimize that distribution strategy? What's your tax bracket now? What's it going to be in the future? Um, you know, what? how can you optimize your Social Security? Do you need the income now? Can you wait till age 70? What makes sense for you? Thinking about Medicare taxation, what is your bracket going to be and how much are you going to have to pay for Medicare? Um, filling in tax brackets in lower income years, as we talked about with um looking at health insurance options, Roth conversions, and long-term care insurance. This isn't something that we're going to hone in on too much today because it doesn't apply directly with taxes, but it really is important to make sure you have a plan for long-term care, whatever that happens to be for you. And then when you get to middle and late retirement, managing and really planning for your RMDs if those are still there, looking at the char you know qualified charitable distributions, looking at social security planning, optimize your optimizing assets for tax efficient estate distributions. Um, again, looking at step up basis strategies, understanding the widow's penalty, all the different things that can inevitably change um, and be surprises as you move along. So that brings us to just this last piece here, which is, um, and this is just kind of what might make sense for you. There's a lot, right? There's a lot that goes on, but if you really set it up well, it doesn't have to be as overwhelming or confusing. It can really make kind of a massive difference. So this is just an example of someone. This is Paul and Joan Price. They have about 2.5 million in investable assets. They have some deferred compensation. They sold a business, social security there. They do annually give about 14,000 to charities. Um, and they have different spending goals between, you know, their retirement income, travel, country club memberships, um, sort of a moderate risk tolerance, and they have two uh, grown children. So the questions that come up for a couple like this is, A, are they going to be able to retire? I think no matter how much somebody has, the question is always, are they going to be okay in retirement? You know, other things, how should they be invested for the next 30 years with the idea that they're healthy and they plan to live a long time? What's the most tax efficient way for them to withdraw from their investments? What's the most tax efficient way for them to give to charities? How should they set up investments to leave the most for their children? 
And are there any other surprises that they should be aware of? And obviously this is simpl a simplified example. So there's a lot of details here, but high level, I think the first thing to look at, and this is how we approach it is just, are they gonna be okay? Looking at those long-term projections, what are the cash needs? What are the, how are the indifferent investments set up and high level, how does everything look? That's sort of a starting place for you is, is what does that look like? I think when you add to that, um, it's just, you know, how can you set things up so that you can optimize things in the for, on the income side, right? So what is the guaranteed income you have coming in? What are the different buckets look like? And this is just an example of saying, okay, they have monthly income of about 21,000. There's a little more they need to supplement. So thinking about what the right strategies are and putting those into those specific buckets and doing some calculations to understand and think about that. Um, moving along then is understanding, okay, well, that's great. We know the timeframes. We know everything looks good. How can you optimize strategies? And this is just an example. Really the highlight here is that you, you can save upwards of a million plus um, long-term if you're able to be do some Roth conversions, think about that efficiently, lower your income in certain years, making sure you're rebalancing appropriately and you're optimizing social security. So this is just an example saying, hey, this can make a massive difference if you think about it the right way compared to just what people might traditionally do without thinking and, and putting some planning around it. And then finally looking at what, what how does that impact then your tax return? Um, and we look at that on an annual basis with clients. Okay, this is great. I like these long-term decisions. How does that impact me this year? And how can I prepare for that? And think about the best tax return situation. So all of those things together and then understanding how the SECURE Act affects you. And we're going to, um, for the sake of time, we've already talked about this, but just looking at all of your assets and saying, okay, what is the impact of these new changes on my specific situation? So the key questions are really saying, hey, let's look at the, let's look at scenarios. Let's look at Monte Carlo's. Let's look at those long-term projections. Then let's allocate those assets correctly for the right buckets, the right amount of income that you want coming in. So you can sleep at night. So you can feel really good about that. And then how can you optimize things from a tax perspective? Um, and social security perspective, and then think about those additional risks that can come into the picture. So that's that's a lot of different pieces. Any any final nuggets that you would add to that, Bob? Um, well, I think Carrie, the um, like I've said, you know, at, at different presentations, even live ones that we did earlier, there's never been a time where I think so many things are coming into play, and it's so important to look at and coordinate things together. Um, you know, between the different acts that have been passed, the um, the standard deduction being higher, um, the it, it just become a very important time, and it's probably one of the most important years we're ever going to have to kind of look at: Are there some decisions we can make now that will impact our uh, long-term wealth going down the road? So um, we'll see what next year brings. But this year has been a really good time because we've had a chance to suspend RMDs for some clients, put them in lower tax brackets. You know, there's just been a lot of things that have happened this year that um, I think it's been a really a time where it's important to look at the, the big, big holistic picture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're seeing this all the time. And so we provide, we wanted to provide this just because a lot, you know, give more education, understand it. And so we really encourage you to think about some of these things for yourself. And if we can be of help, like we said, we're happy to set up a complimentary session where we go through a little bit more of your individual situation. And if long term, there's more that we can help with, you know, then we talk about that. But this second meeting is really not a sales pitch. It's just we think it's more important than ever that everyone be as savvy as they can about this. And so if there's ways that we can help and then if there's longer term ways that we can help you and really put you in a really great situation, then we're, we're happy to talk about that more with you as well. But we want to just, again, acknowledge you for taking the time to learn about this. Thank you so much um, for giving us your attention. I'll be following up afterwards just to, again, touch base with you, address questions since we can't meet face to face in person. But you're also welcome to schedule that meeting now. Those do fill up. So I encourage you um, to take advantage if that makes sense. Yeah, I'd just like, like to, to thank you for your time as well. And uh, everybody stay safe and healthy. Yeah. Thank you again so much. Um, take care. Have a great day and let us know if we can be of help. Thank you.